Hello Biotechnicans. I am Dr. Farhan Zameer, an adjunct professor and academic specialist at Biotechnica Bangalore. As you know that we are into a, a great series and the name of the series is From Ideas to Innovation. Now in this series, this is our second video wherein we are trying to look into various experimental research models which could be actually proposed as your PhD work or your postdoctoral work or it can go for a grant. Now in this particular video, we are trying to give an experimental model for studying kidney stones. So how exactly this could be studied? Let's dwell in. Welcome back. As I told you, for today, we are trying to discuss an experimental model for studying kidney stones. So how do I do, uh, how do I mimic uh, a formation of kidney stones, especially in humans in an in vitro or an in vivo model? So to understand this, let's try to look into the details of it. Now, before I look into the, the formation of kidney stones, here, I need to understand the entire anatomy and physiology of human kidney. And as you see into the cartoon that this is where your entire urinary system or the excretory system, uh, especially in terms of fluid, is being actually based on. So when you look into the, the, the placement of kidney, you now know that we have you know, a pair of kidneys, we have a right kidney and a left, left kidney and this has been connected with the tubular formation and that has been connected to the bag which is called as your, you know, urinary uh, bladder. Now, to dwell upon more, to understand the concept in a much better way, so as we have said that the entire excretion system, that is especially the urine formation system has four important components. The first component is obviously the kidney, the second component is the ureter, the third component is the bladder and the fourth component is the urethra. Now, as we want to know what exactly is a kidney, please remember kidney is the, you know, it has a very important structural and functional unit and these structural and functional unit of kidneys are called as nephrons. Please remember these are called as nephrons. Now, any point of time, if this candles, these important units, are, if they are not working well, then there might be certain problems with the excretory system that is in the formation of urine. Now, by a small infection, okay, there would be an inflammation in the kidneys and this inflammation in the kidney can lead into nephritis and nephritis can induce pain and from that pain starts all the you know free radical elevation you know the formation of stone oxalate formation this entire uh, component is a multi uh, dependent you know approach and hence having a holistic view of the entire system becomes very very important now at this point of time i want to you know classify you know, kidney stones into two major components or two different types based on the location in which the kidney stone is actually, you know, formed. Now, there are two components. One is the stone which has been formed within the kidney. Okay, so this is called as, uh, you know, the, the stone, uh, the, the process of stone formation is simply called as lithiasis. So what is lithiasis? Lithiasis is the formation of stones. That is, lithia is stone. You remember in our you know, primary classes, we studied about lithosphere, that is the sphere with stones. So hence the same terminology has been used here. So you have lithia is the stone and cis is the process of formation of stones. And hence, what is lithiasis? Lithiasis is the general formation of the, the, the stones in human system. But however, depending on where exactly lithiasis is taking place, either the lithiasis can take place inside the kidney or the lithiasis can take place in the urinary system, that is the, the urinary bladder or the, the tubules. So here I can segregate them into the stones which are formed inside the kidney are called as nephrolithiasis and the stones which have been formed into the bladder or into the tubular structure, these are called as ureolithiasis. So now I know that is ureolithiasis and nephrolithiasis. So once I have this component, so as we know that the, there is an entire combination of, you know, the systematic uh, changes both at physical level, physiological level, uh, which can which can actually affect the formation of stones. Now, 
what exactly is the pathophysiology of stone formation. So this has to be properly understood and only then we can actually dwell upon how do I design a therapy, how do I design a diagnostic methodology so that I can detect lithiasis, either nephrolithiasis or urealithiasis. So how exactly is the stone formed? So the stone could be formed in two different approaches. One, there might be certain crystallization of certain salts. This can lead into the addition on an injured cell and this can lead into the formation of a crystal finally develop a, developing a stone. Or there would be an other approach which is called a supersaturation approach and in supersaturation approach there is the crystal nucleus which has been formed and this crystal nucleus will lead into the development of the crystal growth and this crystal growth will then later come together to form aggregation what we call it as crystal aggregation and this crystal aggregation will finally lead into the, the development of the stone and this is how a stone is been actually formed and which can lead into a huge amount of pain either in the in the kidney or into the urinary bladder. Now let us try to understand the etiology of lithiasis. Now there are mainly six different types of stones which have been formed in humans and it can lead into a lot of pain. Uh, lithiasis is also called as or especially nephrolithiasis is specially called as renal calicli or simply in general terminology it is called as kidney stones. Now uh, you will be surprised to know the prevalence of kidney stones in males is 60% higher than compared to the prevalence of females. Then uh, very importantly the recurrence rate in males is also very high. This might be because of their habit, habitat changes which takes place inside the system and however in females there is a special kind of a stone which is called as steroid stones. So these steroid stones are mainly present in females and in, they are not seen in males. So this is how you know the etiology of lithiasis is very very particular in terms of gender, in terms of habit, in terms of habitat and in terms of the niche in which you actually harbor the kidney stones. So following that we have various kinds of therapies uh, you know currently there are uh, few therapies which are uh, in uh, you know uh, greater relief for the for the patient. The first kind of a therapy is called as lithotripsy. Litho is stone and tripsy is blasting. Okay, so you are actually blasting using this technology, you are blasting the stones uh, which have been formed and this technique is called as lithotripsy. Now the other important technique is you know using a urethroscope, you are able to or the clinician is able to retrieve the stones which have been formed. This is another combination. However, you know in most of the cases when, when you have you know severe pain and there are multiple stones which have been developed, you know lithotripsy or uh, urethroscope will not work. The best method is you know undergoing uh, uh, a surgery and this is how there is a retrieval of stones which have been formed either in the bladder or in the uh, kidney itself. Now apart from that there are certain you know drugs which could be uh, utilized to minimize your uric acid level so that you can actually regulate uh, the formation of oxalate formation. One such uh, beautiful drug which works is your allopurinol and apart from that there is also a evidence which shows that the impairment of uh, uh, you know thyroid hormones or uh, that is T3, T4 and TSH can also can lead into various com complications of lithiasis in kidneys. Now what do we do? So I now know what is the reason. Now I know how exactly is the current modern therapy which has been employed. But however since I told you the recurrence rate in males is very very high. So that means to say I already have a history of kidney stones. So what do I do? So rather than giving a therapeutic approach let us try to also understand the preventive approach for this particular experimental model. The preventive approach in most of the cases is dependent on the phytochemicals. Now the plants produce certain metabolites and these metabolites are very very effective against the dissolution of oxalate stones especially calcium oxalate stones and phosphate oxalate you know phosphate uh, stones. So what we are trying to do is let us try to screen down uh, certain phytochemicals which has the ability to dissolve kidney stones. One such beautiful plant which is also called as kidney stone plant or in, uh, 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 in uh, botanical terms it is called as bryophyllum pinnata or it is also called as calanchio pinnata. Now 
the, the this is a very very effective plan and you know there's a lot of research which is going on uh, uh, in in understanding the mechanism of dissolution of this uh, phyto extract with that of the kidney stones so what are the various models so to study this particular interaction of a phytochemical or a chemical or a retrochemical on on an uh, oxalate stone you know we need to refer to certain models because i directly i cannot work on patients so what are the laboratory experimental models i have i can take up microorganisms and study this i can take up a nematode which is called a c elegans i can study using drosophila uh, mouse rat and even you know transgenic varieties now these are the in vivo models however going on to in vitro models wherein you have the synthetic urine stimulator wherein you can actually create the entire formation of sto you know stones by using uh, artificial urine and you can also use a renal stimulator which will act as an in vitro model now between in vivo and in vitro there is a other beautiful model which is available and this model is called as semi in vivo model which talks about your egg chicken egg membrane model you can also consider rbc membrane as a model or you can use the buccal uh, membrane model you know, which are you know very very routinely used models to study kidney stones i am trying to give you the entire plethora of the models which are available which you know depending upon your availability depending upon the availability of funding depending upon the feasibility of time you can actually execute it now let me try to give you certain examples so that you know you will appreciate the illustration in a much better way now uh, especially in terms of egg membrane model you can actually isolate the egg membrane model from the chicken egg okay from once you isolate it then you use it as a dialysis bag and here you add the calcium oxalate and then you can also add uh, the 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 ligand molecule or the chemical molecule which has been anticipated for dissolving the the calcium oxalate stone and that is how you keep it into a buffer allow a particular time and then calculate the rate of dissolution than compared to the normal and induced with that of the treated so that is how you are able to understand using in vitro model how do i actually mimic a kidney stone model now if you are uh, if you have a bit larger facility then you can go for an in vivo model wherein you are actually using drosophila this is a, a non conventional model wherein you are trying to mimic human disorders in drosophila and one such example is a kidney stone now as you know that you know drosophila does not have kidney but however when i look into the drosophila biochemistry especially the malfusion tubule biochemistry the malfusion tubule biochemistry matches human kidneys by around 70 to 80% so here it gives me an opportunity to utilize malfusion tubules as the excretory organ and then try to induce kidney stones on it and we have an excellent data uh, on on uh, you know uh, the the ureolithiasis in uh, drosophila and you can actually read it from the pubmed now apart from that if you already have an animal facility then we would always request you people to go and you know try it out on either a uh, murine model that is you know rats or uh, uh, you know mouse so that you have a much more higher relatability to humans so now how do you actually design your study if i am taking you know a uh, fly as a model i can take up my plant extracts and from this plant extracts i can have uh, an anti uh, you know uh, ureolithiatic model wherein i can take up you know drosophila that is uh, oregon k drosophila oregon k uh, it is called a dmok that is from university of oregon you can consider because i told you the prevalence is more in males you can still consider male flies and then induce them with either calcium oxalate or sodium oxalate in through diet okay normally in this particular study 1% of sodium oxalate is been used and once this has been done you can segregate the male flies in the group of 25 or 50 depending upon the availability and the requirement as group number 1 group number 2 group number 3 and group number 4 whereas in group number 1 will contain only the healthy flies then group number 2 will con contain the induced flies group number 3 will contain induced but treated with your drug molecule in this case it is phyto molecule or in group number 4 can include you know induced plus treated with a standard drug now since i have taken up you know um, phytochemicals as an example i will also take a drug which is from a phytochemical source and one such example is uh, cystone which is marketed under himalaya brand so once this has been done okay later i can look into the 
you know, the pattern of morphogen tubules. I can look into the, the entire biochemistry and biomarkers and microscopy of the morphogen tubule, which will give me a better insights. Now, to, to exhibit certain results so that you actually appreciate the model very well. So, here you can look into the panel number you know, A, wherein you can just look into, you know, the malfusion tubules, which are very, very clear. However, in the next panel, you can see that the malfusion tubules now contains diamond-like structures and these diamond-like sparkling structures are nothing but your calcium oxalate stones. So, these are your kidney stones and you can also see how exactly you can observe the shrinkage of the malfusion tubules. However, in panel number 3 and 4, wherein these are being drug treated or these are being, you know, treated with your phytochemical and you can actually see how exactly there is a reduction of these sparkling molecules, that is your oxalate stones, you know, than compared to induced control and that of your treated. So, with this kind of a comparison, you can establish an easy model to study kidney stones. Now, apart from that, you know, depending upon, you know, what exactly is the availability and, you know, what are the resources which are available for you, you can study the kidney stone model that is the experimental kidney stone model in various animals and we have actually compiled uh, around 17 different kind of in vitro and in vivo models which could help you in understanding kidney stones in a much better way. This has been very recently published uh, from Elsevier. So, you know, uh, uh, you can always refer this particular paper. Now, I need to thank people who were instrumental in getting this all this data. Uh, I need to thank uh, Dr. Aishwarya. I need to thank uh, Avinash, Dr. Karthik, Dr. Abdul, Dr. Pramod and Dr. Madi uh, and uh, Mrs. Uh, Shweta for, for executing all this work. Now, uh, you would be surprised to know this kind of a work was actually being started when all these guys were there in their, you know, in their masters. Okay, so they, were, they were pursuing masters in biotechnology at Mysore. But however, the interest in them actually led on to this kind of beautiful research. And for your surprise, around five to six proteins were structured for the first time. Okay. A student called as Dr. Anirudh Patel, Gururaj Patel, he was actually instrumental in doing a lot of work in designing the, the components for, uh, you know, fly, uh, you know, fly based research. And very importantly, the important uh, message what I want to really, uh, you know, uh, spread across us, these students joined me as just as master students and I am very proud of them that Everybody were able to complete their PhD and now, you know, few of them are also pursuing their postdoc. Now, uh, the intention of all this, uh, you know, special series that is from ideas to innovation is to have a proper mentorship. So, at Biotechnica, we are trying to give you very, very proper mentorship so that we can enrich your scientific knowledge and your scientific career so that, you know, many of the students when they approach us, they are like, you know, they have great ideas, but they don't know how to execute it. They don't know how to present it. So hence, you know, at Biotechnica, we are trying to facilitate, we are trying to help you people so that, uh, you know, we can bring science of your interest so that we can make a very proper systematic flowchart so that you can execute in your particular laboratory. So with this, I just want to tell you that we are there for your you know, assistance at any point of time. What you need to do is just write an email at support at biotechnica.org or you can just get connected to our telegram channel. And that is how we can make sure that we can help you at any point of time in your research. So together we can make a difference is our motto. Thank you very much for staying connected.